In my earliest days as a Christian, I was always taught there were two things that I needed more of, faith and passion. But I've often wondered if some of the conference speakers, pastors that I heard, the books I read, I've wondered if maybe they got it a little bit wrong. Maybe they misunderstood the kind of faith that God is asking us to have and the value that he places upon passion. Let's think about it for a moment. Let's just start out taking a look at faith. Now, obviously, faith is an incredibly important thing. Hebrews chapter 11 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But then it goes on and defines the kind of faith God is looking for. We must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who follow him. But it does nothing about some of our common definitions of faith. It says nothing about being full of confidence. It says nothing about my imagination, my ability to picture the things I'm praying for as if they're done. It literally says nothing about the absence of doubt. And it says not a word about risk taking. And all of those things are the things that were put before me as the definition of faith that I need to have more of. For instance, I was always told that if I was gonna walk in faith, I needed to cast aside all doubt. But the more I read the Bible and the more I work with people and see their walk with God grow, the more I've come to understand that faith and doubt not only can coexist, but often those times of my greatest doubt when I decide to obey anyway are my times of greatest faith. For a biblical definition of faith is trusting God enough to do what he says. No matter how I feel, no matter what I think the outcome would be, I trust him enough that even when I'm full of doubt and he says jump, I jump anyway. Think about Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They uh, were asked to bow down before an idol that Nebuchadnezzar had made, and they knew and understood there was no way they could do that because God had forbidden it. And the king got upset and he said, if you don't, I'm gonna throw you into this fiery furnace. And they told him that our God is able to deliver us. Now that's kind of the Sunday school lesson I had as a little kid. Man, if I am courageous, if I hold on to the fact and the realization that my God can deliver me, then you throw me into a fiery furnace and everything is gonna be okay. But here's the problem with that. First of all, they're the only three dudes, and dudes is in the Hebrew. They're the only three that ever were cast into a fire and came out. But they also said something else. They said, and even if he does not, we're not gonna bow down to your idol, O king. Or one of my favorite prayer meetings in all of the Bible is found in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 12. Uh, James has just been beheaded and Peter is next in line. And so they have an emergency prayer meeting and they're praying that Peter will somehow be delivered from this horrible fate and the church will continue to have the leader that they need. Well, as they are praying, guess what happens? God shows up and he shows up and he lets Peter out of prison. And Peter is so filled with the kind of faith that we think we're supposed to have, surely God's gonna do it, that when God shows up and lets him out of prison, he thinks that he's having a dream. And then that is followed in the next stage by him walking over to the house where the prayer meeting is. And as he knocks on the door, a little servant girl named Rhoda shows up, opens the door, and she sees him and she freaks out. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that he's here. Peter's here, Peter's here. Now, what do all those folks that have been praying for it say when she comes back and says the prayer has been answered? They say, darn it, it's too late. It must be his ghost. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the kind of prayer that I know how to pray. It's the kind of prayer that prays even when we're sure it's too late and God can't and God won't answer it. That's what faith looks like. It's not the absence of doubt. It's not an imagination that pictures things. It's not absolute confidence. It's simple obedience, trusting God enough to do what he says, no matter what's in front of us. You know, it's pretty much the same thing when it comes to our passion and zeal for the Lord. I always thought that he was very concerned with emotively how passionate and zealous I was and what I felt on the inside. And yet we take a look at scripture and zeal isn't anywhere near as important as we've often been taught. Probably the most famous passage about the need for passion and zeal is a letter to the church at Ephesus. It's found in Revelation chapter two. Uh, that's known in my uh, world as the church that lost that love and feeling. But when we take a close look at that passage and see what God says about that church, we discover it was anything but a church lacking in zeal and passion. 
That church, the church in Ephesus, was a church that was very careful with its doctrine. It had incredible determination. When everybody else grew weary, they continued and fought their way through it. They were not lightweights when it came to sin. They saw sin, they dealt with sin, they went after it. In fact, in many ways, the church in Ephesus is exactly the kind of church that we would get on a plane and fly to go see because we'd want to see all the programs and all the things that they were accomplishing. The Lord praises them for pretty much everything except for one thing. He says, you've lost your first love. Now, I often thought of it, and most people tend to think of it in the English language as you've lost zeal and passion because that's how we use the word love. But the actual Greek word that's used in that passage is not a word for passion and zeal, it's the word agape. The same one that we use at weddings out of 1 Corinthians 13, that is full of the actions of, of not keeping track of wrongs, of being kind and, and all of those things that are not feeling words, they're action words. And Jesus didn't say, you've lost your first love, go back and feel what you felt at the beginning. He said, you've lost your first agape, go back and do what you did at the beginning. You see, the problem with the church at Ephesus was they had lost their ability to put the needs and interests of others as more important than their own. They've lost their ability to live out the love that Jesus calls us to in their relationships probably with one another, and my bet is with outsiders as well. And when we have lost love, we have lost everything. Back to that passage in 1 Corinthians 13. I could speak with the tongues of men and angels. I could understand all biblical mysteries. I could have faith that actually moves mountains. People line up after every service and I pray and they are healed. I could be so committed to the needs of the needy that I take every paycheck I ever get and I give it all away to help out. And I could be so courageous and committed that I am willing to die as a martyr. But if I do not have love, the Bible says, I have absolutely nothing. Jesus said, they will know you were mine by your love, which when I think about it, breaks it down to the most simple step of obedience. Love God with all of my heart, love others, and in that is contained all of the law of God. Faith and passion, faith and zeal. You know what? In some ways, at least as we define them today, maybe they've been a little bit overrated. So what does all this mean in our day-to-day -day life? Well, first of all, it means we probably don't need more faith. We just need to keep on with our next step of obedience. If you're praying for something right now, just keep on praying. No matter what you feel, no matter what is going on around you, just do what God told you to do. If you're in the midst of a relationship that's fallen apart and you feel like the other side's not doing what it ought to do, and you're wondering, God, where are you? Well, what's he asking you to do? He's asking you to just obey. It's always about taking the next step of obedience. We don't need more passion. All we actually need is a tiny mustard seed of faith. You see, at the end of the day, it's always about obedience. That next simple step and doing what God tells us to do. No matter how we feel, no matter what we think, we trust him enough to do what he says.